I think that was a silent uh, signal that uh, we should get started. Okay, very much welcome this beautiful April afternoon. Good to see so many people here. I can recognize some artists, I can recognize some other people, and some newcomers, I hope. Because it's going to be a very exciting moment for the museum and for us all to have a talk here with uh, our very, very special guest, artist, Sharon Hayes. And um, I will just say welcome to you as an interim director and then hand over here very, very briefly to Lena Essling, who has been the curator and worked with the exhibition and with Sharon Hayes for some time. And uh, before we get the talk going here, I think you would like to say a couple of words about the exhibition which we're going to open tonight. Okay. Sure, thank you. Well, welcome again. <laughs> so great to see you all. Uh, being here, um, Stockholm is really busy uh, week art-wise this week, so I'm glad to, that you all made it here. Um, very soon we will open the show, so I'm just going to say three sentences about what you're about to see. I think you're probably familiar with, um, with the Sharon Hayes' work, most of you, and those who are not. Um, this exhibition um, deals with Sharon, I mean, it presents part of Sharon's practice with uh, mining voices, both personal and public voices, mixing public space with private space, or rather bringing the private into the public, let's say. These are sound works, videos, uh, graphic works, textile, um, all dealing with uh, history, language, and the tensions between them. And uh, we've had as one of our themes, something that Sharon brought into the project early, the idea of echo, echo as the classical myth of echo, uh, the, the nymph who is cursed, who is not able to speak her own uh, mind or to, to own her own presentations or performance, but can only echo what someone else says as uh, just voice and sound. Um, yes, <laughs> let's get more into the, to the, to the exhibition in the presentation when, when we open uh, at 6.30. Sharon Hayes lives in, is active in Philadelphia, which, which could almost seem like a, a thought or even a, a, an ongoing work. It's a place steeped in American politics, full of monuments, uh, the, the um, uh, Liberty Bell, I'm being voiced, yeah, great, yeah, the Liberty Bell, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Um, Sharon is, has been active in New York uh, for many years, but is now in Philadelphia teaching and also working and uh, has been presented in many shows internationally over the years. We are so happy to have uh, acquired a huge installation by you in, in my little corner of the world. Anyone would love you, which is a heart of the exhibition, I would say. And we are super excited tonight to have your long time friend and uh, also an artist. Um, Every Ocean Hughes, formerly known uh, to many of us as Emily Royston, who is an interdisciplinary artist working with photography, video, text, several projects to do with curating and as well and performance. Performance, of course, being one of your main things. I'm not doing such a great presentation. So I'm leaving the... No. <laughs> How can I do this in front of somebody who's like Mrs. Boyce? So I'm... <laughs> no, Mrs. Boyce. Okay. Yes, yes, you can. We can fix that later. Okay, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much. And looking forward to this talk on life, performance, death. Who knows? I've only heard scraps of what you're about to talk about. So, looking forward. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, Hello, everybody. <laughs> Sharon and I did not go for the Madonna mics. We, um, <laughs> I thought that I would take the chance to start this conversation as a way to really welcome Sharon to Stockholm. Um, for me, it's a very special pleasure to have um, a good friend and someone whose work I've followed since the very, before I would comfortably call myself an artist, is just the time when I met you. So this whole time uh, that I've been working, I've also been watching you work, um, which I realized is about 18 years now, mm -hmm. if that's about right. Um, 
So it's a very special chance to think about the what I consider kind of my hometown, New York, and you know, actually both of us were born in Maryland, um, and it's true. yeah, it's true. <laughs> lived many years in New York, and so it's bridging my new town. I live here in Stockholm, um, and I'm able to welcome you here. It's very special. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It is also a deep pleasure to encounter you here and to have you share the space with me. So thanks. Yeah. So there were so many ways in which this conversation is, um, I think it's the first time we've done something like this formally, but we've of course been talking uh, um, for 18 years. So we were thinking, how do we manage or give form to a conversation like this, especially because you haven't even seen the work yet. So um, Sharon was... I think when I asked that, I said, what can we achieve and what do we want to do with this? Sharon said um, she really liked the idea of, of, in a very simple way, just starting the exhibition, the opening through friendship. Um, and I thought that was a beautiful, simple way for us to arrive here and to be present in front of you. Um, it's also that a, both of us really have practices that are very indebted to and embedded in the place where we've been working and started to work, which is New York, which is the queer community there, um, and the histories that we inherited by growing up there, by becoming artists in that territory, in that area, in that context. So we've both been very uh, literal about drawing out that relationship. Um, and so that's another way in which we kind of acknowledge friendship and collaboration and influence and context through a lot of our works. Um, and then everything that we talked about where we kept wanting to bring up themes and ideas for the discussion, we kept talking also about love. Um, and this becomes a starting point and a point that we will hit a few times. Um, and in a way, it's also formal to the exhibition and to us appearing together. Because um, I wrote a text, I don't even know. The, one of the only reasons I know about this text is because you like it. <laughs> you know, I probably would have been something that just was in my computer, but you're the person who keeps bringing it out. Um, so when did I write that, chair? No, just kidding. A while ago. It was before 2007. Yeah. Um, so, and that is, was a text about um, queer love. And um, yes, I wrote it in, uh, in the context of an LTTR project, and we can maybe get into what, what that is. But we thought we'd also just start with um, how you found that and how you've used that as an entrance to our sharedness. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful text. It's maybe a paragraph long. Um, and it exists inside of a work that is here in the Moderna, uh, a work called Gay Power, which is a collaboration with Kate Millett and the Women's Liberation Cinema, and includes kind of narration from Kate Millett from uh, on onto um, footage that she was a part of shooting from a distance of 40 years, and then narration uh, that I speak. And included in that narration, I quote every... Um, and this text. And it's funny because when you asked me that, like, where did you find that text? I was like, where did I find that text? <laughs> um, and I think that um, it, there, are, there are these funny things that um, when we were discussing, talking today, also I was like, when did we first meet? Um, and what I remembered right on top of wondering when we first met or where I first uh, encountered that text were just this kind of wave of all of these memories of our intersections, uh, both in time and space. And so one of those intersections, um, uh, there's two of those intersections that are that are, that are maybe important, and it, I'll follow the thread that you bring up the um, to, to what we're talking about right now. They're all important. Um, but the... Um, in 2007, um, I was approached by um, Stephen Kent Jusick, who was a programmer for the um, Mix Experimental Gay and Lesbian Film Festival in New York. And I ran into him on the street, and he's like, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. He kind of has this very like e excited personality. Oh, 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 I want, we found this footage in a locker in Los Angeles from the 
1971 Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade, and it's silent, and we want to show it at Mix, but it's silent, as if people wouldn't watch it. So can you put sound to it? And um, I walked away thinking, does he mean me? <laughs> like, is he talking to me? Because I think his vision was that I would create a kind of um, music score that would make it kind of lively and, you know, happening. <laughs> and, um, and I had been thinking a lot about, um, I guess, as I, as I said yes, I just said yes, sure. And I started to look at that footage, and it's this early footage of uh, what Kate Millett ends up calling a becoming tribe. So all of these queer people strutting for the camera and kissing the camera and loving each other and um, loving those of us sort of who see them through this film. Um, and on the heels of uh, another work called Everything Else Has Failed, Don't You Think It's Time for Love, where I was trying to deal with war, but by through a kind of language of love, um, I had been thinking, in Everything Else Has Failed, uh, which is also here at the Moderna, I, um, I was speaking in uh, Midtown Manhattan. I went out every day for five days uh, of a work week to speak a love address to uh, um, an unnamed lover uh, who for some reason I was separated from that the text didn't exactly describe. But I was also pe speaking to our public, our public in New York, trying to speak about war, um, trying to speak about longing, trying to speak about personal desire and political desire. And Midtown Manhattan, for those of you who have been there, is a teeming, teeming public, particularly when it's like warm and it was September, so it was a nice weather. and. Um, but it's pretty heteronormative <laughs> because there's the publishing industry and there's the banking industry. And so people who are going to work in those industries have to kind of dress the part. And I didn't want this love letter, essentially, this love address to slide into heteronormative love. So I kind of butched myself up a little bit. I, th I said it on Wednesday. I thought of myself as kind of like a dyke temp. Like, I don't quite fit in, uh, but I'm trying. <laughs> Um, and, and then after, so as I concluded that piece and was spending all this time with the gay liberationists, I was thinking, what is specific about gay love? What is specific about queer love? Does it, is it different? Um, and I think from a political point of view, uh, I found myself resistant on one hand to thinking that queers held something special, you know, that we held something that, um, that other people couldn't also have or mobilize or claim. But in the space of these works, in the space of my work and then the women's liberation cinema, I came across your text, which is really like making a proposal for queer love as something distinct and as something um, resistant and as something um, that is operating, I think, importantly and strongly against um, heteronormativity and and the relationships that heteronormativity has to large large political structures, and um, so I think I, I started to to sort of see these liberationists. Um, I guess another way that I have talked about it is like as as kind of exerting a power um, that when I first came out in the nineties and encountered this sticker, you know, gay power. I always thought it was a little bit um, like just a, a kind of power light, you know? <laughs> uh, borrowing from black power, that it, was kind of, that it was kind of rhetorical. That it was rhetorical. That gay power came from black power and was a rhetoric, but not really this way that I started to see it, in part through your text and in part through this encounter with this film, as, as really specific and strategic, which I think you also use that word in, in the text, that there are strategies that strutting and being a queen and um, uh, kissing in front of the camera is um, this really important sort of radical labor of um, making public appearance and making a public appearance through um, like em embodiment and and yeah, I, I don't know if I can kind of turn the question back to you in terms of the text because it's, 
because it's distant. So now it, it, it exists in two places. It's true. I love it. And um, so it exists in gay power. And then also um, I recently published, had the privilege to publish a monograph with Faden. And, and there's a section in there called Artist Choice. And I get to select works and writings and other works that have um, yeah, inspired me and influenced me. And it appears again there, which every didn't know until I showed up today <laughs> or last week. Um, yeah, but I guess I guess um, may, maybe you can talk a little bit, if you can, about how how and if love as a as a strategy as a tactic um, informs your your work still. I, I said that I don't remember the text, but I was just going to finish that sentence. So part of me does remember it. Love as a strategy a site and a scene. So one of the other things that keeps coming up between Sharon and I is this um is is writing which we're talking about but also staging. Um and um yeah, so in that way it's that's also in that text the kind of the the site and the scene of the love. Um but I think that I'll um pick up on what you were saying and talk about um the context in which I wrote that, um, I think it was posed as a question, like the word love was in the question. And so, and, and that's um, what I jumped up on. But it was within the context of LTTR, which in many ways was um, uh, the reason that I ever became an artist was because I was like, I let myself kind of occupy this position because it was within a collective structure and I felt like I was doing it with and for other people. Um, I, at the time, would not have been comfortable. Um, I had at the time what I called use value issues. Um, now I think of it more as a desire to be um, in service, of service um, to more than myself and my community and a, and a political community. Um, but at the time, I thought I had use value issues and I had to be useful to the world. Um, and somehow being in this collective and working um, was the way that I uh, let myself inhabit that position. And so there's a lot of love in that. Um, and in the work that LTTR was doing, which uh, we called it a feminist, gender queer, independent art journal. Uh, and it was anti-capitalist, feminist, gender, queer, independent art journal. Um, <laughs> we we were ambitious, um, and uh, and it cost ten dollars, so very ambitious. Um, <laughs> um, but it was uh, within the context of LTTR that I was able to write that, you know, and it was about. Um, and I think that there's something simultaneous in the in the desire to write and to write about love, because the writing for me, uh, LTTR was the first place that I ever wrote anything, and I, I don't even think I'd ever written anything just for myself. There was no kind of private writing before there was public writing. So it was in the kind of a call to a community, in the way that I, th I thought it was beautiful what you just said, the people on the screen kind of love the people who are watching them. You know, for me, this, this writing was, um, was because I was kind of making a community, a constituency at the um, at the same time that I was able to, um, yeah. So, can yeah, I yeah. Uh, interrupt for a second? There's something interesting, I think, um, that's kind of shaping in this constellation for me. Yeah, love is a strategy, a sight, a scene. When you first said it, I was thinking of sight as a kind of place, context, location, and scene. Immediately I was thinking of like a, um, a film scene or, or, a, um, or a theater scene, which is one interesting way to think about it. But then immediately, as you were talking, thinking about like a, a social scene, a political scene. And I remember in 2006, so we, I think we met somewhere in 2000, and I was living in New York, but I was about to go to grad school in Los Angeles. And so I had been living in New York. I moved to New York in 1991, um, in the middle of the AIDS crisis, um, and then left New York in 2000 to go to LA for uh, what ended up being four years. It was a three-year program. I stayed for a year. And when I came back, I think we had met before that, but I came back and I felt like 
everything about the communities that I had been a part of changed in part because you all were there like LTTR and, and your scene in a way. And it was a really profound experience a to experience the city so differently and B to experience your scene because I, because I felt like I had this recognition. I had a, I, I think a lot of maybe why we were also interested in starting with and, and holding on to our relationship is that for me, so much of how I became an artist, a queer person, um, a political person is infused with things that are both totally anecdotal and mundane, like sitting at brunch. Uh, and I remember sitting at brunch with this person who was my girlfriend at the time who was nine years older than I was, and then Kate Hardy, and I think somebody Kate Hardy was dating, uh, who came and joined us at just in the backyard of this place. Kate Hardy was a member of the LTTR collective. And I remember we were just talking about David Wanarovich, actually. And suddenly this person who I was dating, who was nine years older, who had been a friend of David's, David Wanarovich is an amazing artist and writer who died of AIDS in 1992, started crying there at brunch in, the, in an outdoor garden, you know, on a Sunday afternoon. And I think Kate maybe had, was reading something, maybe it was like something that Kate had just read, uh, read of David's in a book and brought it out. And, and it was this incredible experience I had of realizing like this, this one person is in one generational position, Kate, and in some ways you all are in another, and I'm somewhere in between. Because when I came to New York, I had an experience of the AIDS crisis, but it wasn't being friends with David Wanarovich. It wasn't, so I came to New York and everything I did was infused with people dying, but they weren't my friends, my colleagues, my direct, they were all these people who I was starting to learn about or meet or understand and who in a way I aspired to be. And then I think for Kate it was a deferred relationship to that moment because after, yeah, after Proteus inhibitors and when it became possible for people to live with AIDS, New York City changed a lot, changed dramatically. So. Um, in a way, what was so interesting to me is as I encountered you, I often had this kind of scene envy, like, I don't have a scene. I felt like I didn't have a scene. I felt like I was kind of, in a way, straddled between scenes, which is maybe true and not true, because, of course, I have one also with you and with your scene. I was immediately a part of it because it's open and it's porous and um, we matter you know, we all matter to each other and mattered. And to each you were other. in the first LTTR. And I was in the first LTTR. It's true, I was in the scene. Yeah. Um, I don't know what she's talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, um, but I also think there's something about that that now that we're talking about it may have a relationship to time or how I understand and live time, and how you do. Um, you used this word earlier that I really appreciated that you developed, I think, an uncounted called a live time. I, I feel like a lot of the things I'm the things I've been interested in are these kind of gaps of time or or a an echo, a bounce of of a certain moment of time into the present moment. But my experience of your work and your person is this really, yeah, this deep kind of luscious lingering in maybe what you could call a live time. Like that's a really nice word for it. <laughs> what is a live time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> geez, um, well, I well, one of the kind of image you'll see that is mostly textual um, is the is the text itself, which I I also try and distribute as a poster and as an image, so it's something that you can live with. Um, uh, but that will come up. But when I wrote, um, it was in that project Uncounted, and it was that was all about like the politics of performance. Um, and I started asking questions around um, the ways that museums were having this museums and institutions, so various kinds of institutions, were having this renewed moment of of thinking performance was new again, um, and intersecting with like this um, embrace of the choreographic. It was about five years ago, I'd say, and there were all of a sudden all these conferences. Um, and I 
it seems as if I was a usual suspect because I was invited to all of them. So um, I was formulating this set of questions each time I went to one of them, and um, that's how I wrote Uncounted. So in a way, I think I, the, I came to the term a lifetime because the question was what happens when institutions that are built to historicize and exhibit authorize aliveness, which to me was performance. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, that's where the term came from, but it has come to sort of even retroactively, I can look at my work and think uh, that I was kind of already doing that. But um, you know, the, the thing about a lifetime and the luscious, what was it? Lingering. Luscious lingering. <laughs> Um, is, uh, um, you talked the other night when you were speaking at Konzfak about um, how much preparation it takes, you know, and I would say it takes a lot of preparation to lusciously linger, you know, um, so about in attempting to create a lifetime, it's, um, you know, there's a, a 500 kind of questions that get you to the moment where you push all of these other things back in order to create the space um, to work in that way. And now I'm speaking not about myself or the writing, but actually in terms of making work. So if I'm making performance work that um, is attempting to engage in some sort of a lifetime, which um, as a material, you know, because often that's the only thing I know about it is that I'm trying to create this kind of space and this kind of time. And then the particular words or the particular gestures that come about in that often can even surprise me. Um, of course, I have roadblocks and I have, goal, I'm, I'm, I said roadblocks, I have um, markers and um, uh, goals, I guess. I have, I have structure, but... Um, but it's within this kind of thing about a lifetime. And I think for a while I was just thinking of it as improvisation. Mm -hmm. um, and of improvisation, I think it's on that poster. No, it's on a different poster. But improvisation to me is something that is mostly citational in that you have to have so many references. It's like preparing. You have so many um, references and preparations in order to get to that moment. Mm -hmm. So it's all about what you kind of bring in, into those. You were talking about preparing in terms of how you get yourself um, ready to be on Fifth Avenue and 61st Street. Mm -hmm. um, so if we're speaking about time, what kind of time would you say you're in that work? in that, on that corner. Yeah, that's an interesting, um, that's an interesting question because in some ways uh, everything else has failed is um, mobilized by the love letter and by, um, I was interested in when, when moments of love and war interact and, and therefore took myself to this sphere of correspondence, late 19th century, early 20th century, the moment where people were writing to each other, sort of, and sending those letters through the post. And it's su that's such a curious mom time, because in a way, I guess it could, you could say that's a kind of delay, or like communication in delay. It's not immediate. You're, you're writing the letter, perhaps, from your own bed uh, with, you know, with a light, um, sort of low next to you and you're in this kind of space with the other who is not there. So you're in time and space with the other but the other is not there. Um, and then you send it in the post and who knows how long it takes because also perhaps it's there's a war going on and things get interrupted and delayed and may never arrive and then maybe a month later or six weeks later or eight weeks later you get something back from the other who was in that time four weeks before. So I guess it's a, st a stutter time or a time of, a, yeah, a time of a delay. But I find uh, there's probably a ton of other words we could use to describe it. I think that um, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, which is both maybe true of 
when you said like, okay, sometimes you have to keep all these things away, that I think something like a scene, for instance, which has, a scene can have so much negative sort of connotation because of exclusion or this idea of exclusion. But one of the things I think is interesting is that, is that sometimes there are um, things that become mobilized through, through a demarcating of a boundary, like that I am in this space, not that space, that, um, that I'm here with you. Um, that I'm here with us, that I'm here. And I think that for me, um, yeah, that that aliveness is also um, maybe um, varied and differential, like that we can cohabitate, like we can be in the same uh, space and potentially existing in slightly different times, um, maybe because of the psychic dimension of of language and love and desire and uh, presence that you're here, but also a little somewhere else. And there's really nice, I guess what the, the thing I think is interesting about your work is this way that you offer, uh, you do offer a boundary, you offer a kind of demarcation. So there are these things that are kept at bay or held away, but inside of that, there's often a kind of relaxing of the rules that happen <laughs> inside of the boundaries. Um, I mean, I've experienced that. I remember with you asking me to participate in something where I was like, "What do I? When do I do that? <laughs> what do I do?" Um, but also, when I come to watch something or be a part of it, and even in a certain way in the space of exhibition, um, which is maybe harder to do. Uh, with ob objects rather than bodies or something, pr present bodies. Um. Mm -hmm. One of the, um, if we go back to thinking about strategies, um, you know, uh, I guess it's strategies and preparation. I mean, you have often called on and used, kind of called back into time and back into action, very particular um, references and uh, not so much objects, but language, right? So um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about that while, when you're talking about like this kind of stutter or um, uh, and talking about kind of belonging or um, I think the thing about the word scene and it's funny that you and I thought that what we were going to keep talking about would be love somehow but like um, it, this word scene has, is, is creeping up on us but um, you know self-selecting mm -hmm. right so uh, self-proposing self-selecting um, it's we are not exactly using the word community mm -hmm. um, uh, that's interesting to me, um, but context, scene, sight, um, love. But now, just sorry, I, I, I went off, but um, I'm thinking to go back yeah, to this thing about good. you drawing on the very particular and pulling into the present moment. Talk about that, because that is in so many of your yeah. works. Yeah. Um, I mean, of course I have come to... I have come, which maybe has started to be a little bit of a block of understanding, but I, I came um, maybe in my early 30s when I had some distance, like after this <laughs> scene, as in a theatrical scene, that I was describing in br at brunch in the backyard, to understand my generational specificity as when I came to New York. And, and that in a way, because I didn't feel quite of a time, even though I was, uh, I couldn't understand it at the time. Um, and so it felt like, okay, I'm, I'm looking to other times um, for, for my uh, affinity or for kind of collaboration or for um, some kind of recognition to see myself, to understand myself. Um, just jump in there for a second because I just want to say I think something that Sharon has said many times um, and very eloquently and it's been impactful to me to hear you say it I'm not sure it's been said in this room exactly now but which is what was like this primary scene of being in New York um, 
just at the in relationship to the AIDS crisis. So for for your friend in the backyard, for many of the people we are now able to call our friends, their friends that many of them had all just died. And then there's Sharon who comes along and that experience isn't exactly yours, but it's very close and it's adjacent and the people you love have loved and lost. Um, and then I'm just behind that. So I was able with that little bit more distance to look at that, but you were so close to it, you were feeling waves of it, you know? Yeah, and it is, it's true, it is like, um, I, I don't think I have yet found the right word to describe um, sort of my position because it isn't exactly witness. It is something um, <laughs> like kind of having this secondary impact, having this impact through, through, um, mm -hmm. or being almost, you know, almost there or just next to or adjacent, as you say, that's an interesting way to think of it. And, um, and it's amazing to me how formative those positions are and they don't take us out of step with each other or they don't take us out of a conversation, but they do, they have for me deeply impacted, um, sort of my relationship to, um, perhaps to history, to experience, to collaboration, to um, the, the, other thing, the other thing that's maybe worth noting that is interesting to me is of course when I got to New York and the, predominantly what, what, what I was also encountering was this amazing, amazing force of production, activist production, art production, political production that was um, countering this governmental neglect of the AIDS crisis. And that was unbelievably profound. And from that perspective of myself as a 21 year old watching, you know, like meeting a frontline AIDS video activist, you think, oh, this person has always been this way. Yeah. But of course, they just became that, like the year before. They had to or become that. They had to become yeah. that. And it was fresh, and it was becoming. It wasn't actually fixed, and it, it, it hadn't been there. And so I think, um, for me, in some ways, I'm, yeah, I think that um, the experience of, I, I asked you, I think in email, like, I always feel like the word collaboration, I said it about you and your practice, maybe it is also true of me, I feel like the word collaboration is to, like wholly inadequate to describe the relations that make up this work. And they're so, they proliferate so deeply and so widely. Um, and, and so I, I guess I'm wondering for you, um, I, I didn't know that actually, it's crazy I didn't know that you didn't think of yourself as an artist when you were participating in, like that LTTR was... I mean, I was doing the Whitney Museum Independent Study Program, right? <laughs> and I, so, but I wasn't. I, I could say I wasn't comfortable, um, and I had studied international politics and the history of social movements um, as my education, and so the art thing came at the very last minute, um, and so I had like a. I was just in count. I had didn't know anything about art history, or um, and I hadn't. Uh, so I didn't have like a developed form. I I was more had a political mind at that point, um, and that's what got me into the Whitney program. But that's when I met you. I think was yeah. when I went to my interview there, and I looked around the studios, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> um, "That's the first time I saw you." I guess I think um, that's true. Yeah. Do you, Do you think? Um, do you think? That we are avoiding the word community? Do you feel like you avoid the word community? or? Um, I don't think that I avoid it. Um, I guess it's kind of, this will be great, whoa. Um, maybe I stopped um, circulating it so much um, because I think around LTTR, um, and also that's David Wanarovich's face, so that's something else that I've directly referenced his, his work before. Um, so... Um, uh, no, I don't particularly avoid it, but I think around LTTR there was this, um, you know, that word was like attached to LTTR um, in in every sentence practically, um, and so maybe there's a, a part of me that wanted to just 
describe it differently um, and uh, maybe even be more specific, you know, which is like getting to queer love. Like maybe you would say LTTR is queer love instead of LTTR is a community or is a collaboration or is a collective because the important thing about, um, uh, I mean, I, I don't really want to dramatize the feelings or the, the affect of the LTTR community, um, but it was very important to all of us who were a part of it. Um, but the important thing to me was always that, that it was uh, various, that it was self-selecting and that it was shifting and that it was um, uh, porous and intergenerational and all of these things. So in some ways that can easily be described as a community, but it's also something that is like uh, kind of bigger and more various than that. Well, there's also something, I guess, that we could segue into briefly, and then maybe we check in about time, because we wanted to leave time for you to uh, interject and, and participate also. Um, the other thing that is remarkable about LTTR um, is that the very name, LTTR, means many things, um, and is and it's never quite stable. like okay, it's partially, you know, lesbians to the rescue, or it's partially, I mean, in different incarnations, I've come to understand the acronym as standing for different things. And when you posited that about, okay, maybe we call LTTR community, or maybe we call it queer love, I recognize also something that we, we use differently in our work, but um, that it, it's interesting to me, uh, I, I in conversation with Lena, I kind of, took up the opportunity, which was a kind of delightful opportunity for me to call this show Echo, because I love Gayatri Spivak's writing on the um, the mythic figure Echo and thinking of the this nymph who was cursed um, because, because she had a gift for language. She was cursed to not be able to speak her own words, but to only repeat. And, and so in some ways when you, I think what you do really um, richly in your writing is in some ways, um, I don't know if they're metonyms, but you make substitutions like something for something else sometimes, or that you posit something that needs an argument behind it or needs to be a proposal, is imaginary, isn't necessarily descriptive, but is propositional or um, becomes real through the writing, uh, even you know, queer love is strategy, sight, scene. Um, and I think for me, as I, so I, I kind of took this opportunity to sort of indulge my pleasure of echo, but as I've been asked about it um, and asked to speak about why it's important, I've been thinking that it's a labor and a labor of imagination to take somebody's el somebody else's words and to make it make sense or a new sense, to make it, sort of speak for one. And that there's something, I think, interesting, um, yeah, in maybe what the plasticity with which we both approach language, even though from very different perspectives, of course, or, or through different strategies, I could say. Yeah, this, this question of language, of course, comes up for you, I'm sure, constantly. Um, and just when you were speaking a little few questions ago, I was thinking about, um, actually, when you were talking about collaboration. Um, one of the, yes, collaboration, but also a lot of my work I think of as generating vocabulary, um, things for, for which we can use, ways in which we can... Um, communicate things that we might need, you know? Um, and and that's something that is uh, never done alone. And so the scene, the scene of my work has never been me, you know? It's, it's always been um, looking at you and working with LTTR and inviting you to be in this project and inviting so many people. You were both in the performance at uh, that's Malin Arnell in um, art in general related to Uncounted. Um, so, you know, at every chance, inviting other people to uh, be inside the work. Um, and uh, I think that a lot of that I understand from being um, enthralled by and learning from those early um, 
uh, gay power and AIDS activist groups and what those strategies were. My desire was never to appear by myself. I always imagined appearing alongside with amongst others. Right. In you know, right. and I th I think that that's all a gesture that you're constantly um, negotiating too. Yeah. Yeah. Even in terms of having this show here at the Moderna, because I think um, I've had the feeling as I've been here, and and you can never fully know this, but it's such. It's such a pleasurable feeling and such a privileged feeling in a way I, it's a moment to thank you all also is, um, you know much more about this context than I do. I, I have you know a very sort of lucky and fortunate invitation to come into it that's probably coming from some specific reason for me to be here. And when I arrive, I'm not exactly sure all of the sort of components of that reason for me to be here. But it's been really interesting to be here this week and start to feel them just in small interactions or, or a kind of energy from someone. And it makes the work um, a, a so much more pleasurable and B so much more meaningful. Um, so maybe that's a, yeah. Uh, yeah, ask questions. You have questions? Or tell us things. Or, yeah. <laughs> you can tell Sharon why she's here. <laughs> oh yeah, you can have my mic. <laughs> yeah, let's imagine we're in a nice, small, friendly room and you can just ask what you want. This is a safe space. I mean, I to... know, I, th I think one of the challenges, of course, is we haven't talked about a concrete work or a concrete uh, moment in time, but or you could say, what's that? <laughs> um, so it it might be hard to uh, to formulate a question, which means it certainly doesn't have to be a question. It can be just something you're thinking alongside of these thoughts. Uh, hi, and thank you very much for this talk, and also the one you held on Wednesday on Kunstfach. Ah, uh, and <laughs> so what I want to ask is actually about something you said there, which may make it a little bit weird for those who weren't there, but I'll try and make sense of it. Uh, so in this piece where you were speaking the love letters, uh, there was the sentence of the Wednesday letter saying, I am suspended between silence and repetition, which has made a huge impression on me, and it's been stuck in my head uh, since Wednesday. Um, and I just wanted to see if you would elaborate a little bit about whether or not that it was a thought or a reflection of the whole war situation that this is like the repetition of the human condition in some sort or if that it's great that you bring it up i don't think it's too obscure for everyone the the piece is out there and you can hear it in context but um yeah i'm doing this love address and at a certain moment uh, three quarters into the address i say to the lover uh, i don't have any more Wor new words, um, I'm seized between silence and repetition. And it's, it's great, actually, what you're suggesting, because, in fact, I was thinking, uh, I think, about two spheres of, of repetition. One, not war, but very related, which is war protest. And I was thinking about my own participation in this idea of, like, um, you know, we're powerful, we're mighty, we're like, stop the war, like, um, hey, hey, ho, ho, you know, Iraq war has got to go. Like, these ways of um, believing, because you have to, that, um, that I can uh, affect change with the, the, with the volume, like with, with amplifying our voices, with repeating our voices, with insisting, like repetition as insistence. But I did have the feeling from 2003 to 2007, I also had this kind of depressing feeling of, of the repetition of a kind of powerlessness. 
um, like here we all are again. And okay, again, the Bush administration won't heed this call, which of course in 2003 was worldwide. Um, uh, so, so it was not so much like history repeats as much as it was what does it mean for us to kind of go into this form again and again and claim power um, when I don't feel that's where we are or I am. And then the other repetition I was thinking about was that thing that happens in an intimate relationship where, <laughs> where your thoughts to yourself are so close to the thoughts you speak out loud to your lover that you're like... Uh, on one hand, like in a in a moment when everybody is together, where you're like, have I already said this before? <laughs> um, and in a moment when you're apart, this thing where you just can't can't stop saying, "I miss you, I miss you, I miss you." So I think it was um, thinking through both of those things, and then as we bring it up in this conversation, of course, maybe that does in some ways have a what it was doing rhetorically in the text was also marking, I was about to do a set of quotes. What follows immediately after are a set of literal citations, which don't exist in any of the other Monday through Friday. So there's one moment where I do what I could have bounded with literal quotes that ends with the Mother Teresa quote. Thank you. It's a nice way to think about it, helpful for me. Yes. Okay. I don't need a microphone. Okay. Um, well, you just named the Bush, Bush administration. Uh, the time was uh, now we are in time of Trump, and of course the rights of people of different directions, sexual directions, are definitely um, step on. Is it something that you reflect on? Is it something that you will take up on? Yeah. Um, take up in my work or just, I mean, it's uh, the, the work um, the work that uh, Lena um, began with in my little corner of the world, Anyone Would Love You um, is a work that goes back to these newsletters from 1955 to 1977 pre-Stonewall and it's super humbling to go back to those in part because, um, yeah, you, I confront people living very, very vulnerable and constricted lives that, um, that one can think is a historical condition but is not, even before Trump, of course. Um, and that particularly in the queer community, we live in such differ differential relationship to um, what our friend Dean Spade uh, names life chances, um, depending on our uh, ethnicity, our class, um, our gender uh, presentation expression, um, you know, our upbringing, our uh, all sorts of historic and present things that collude to create very different um, possibilities for all of us. And I think that the this moment of time that we are living in now um, is, a, is, a, is another, another really urgent moment to, um, to work, to work, to act, to labor, to struggle um, with how to create other f ways of being. Um, and I think for all of us that will mean something different. For some of us that will mean we take to the streets and we shout really loud and repeatedly. For some of us it'll mean we retreat to a place and a space where we can protect um, and give protection to super vulnerable uh, and, and, and or more vulnerable, you know, people who have become more vulnerable in this time. And I think all of those, and then everything, you know, everything sort of around that. I do feel like at this moment I'm yeah I'm I'm as sort of befuddled as the next person about uh, just about the sort of insanity uh but but I also feel like I I imagine you have this here too but certainly in the states there's so many amazing things happening in the face of this urgent urgency and and old and new urgency um, and so 
I think right now I'm, I'm trying to listen to a lot of people who are on the front lines, um, Black Lives Matter movement, and um, uh, yeah, certainly just like these young um, Congress women, for instance, um, um, who are sort of, you know, have, have received the brunt or might have the brunt or burden um, far more than I do of this ire, or this rage, or this hatred, um, but also to look for uh, how I can best do how I can best do work. And so, for myself, in relation, like maybe in this porous or or this porous space of a lifetime, which every has uh, nicely sort of framed out. Sometimes it feels important to take something up in my work and sometimes it feels important to take it up in my personhood and my civic, as a civic person. Any questions? Okay, I'll come with the mic because we're recording. You start because you also have all these other, like this publicity. You know, you have a few of these terms, and then I. One of the things I guess, I, I do I do think, scene the 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 conditions of a scene, have, have uh, been really foundationally sort of how I came to understand myself. And one of the things that's interesting about a scene, if, if in the early 90s I arrived in New York and I started going to all sorts of things, performance events being one of them, which took me to a club, uh, you know, or to after hours at this club and this club at eight o'clock and this club. And one of the things that's interesting about those things is you don't, you like also have no idea where you are. You're a little bit like, where am I? Like, not only can you not find the number of the place on the door, but you know, somebody told you to go there and you're not sure if it's this door or that door or is it this time or that time? And I, I think actually that being a bit, you know, um, lost is also par part of the way in which you're there. You're also therefore in active um, construction and relation and understanding. And I think you're right that that isn't how we use community at least, like community in a way, is often coming from a place of naming. Like this thing, I can see it, I can name it, I can um, tell you where it is and uh, who's, a, you know, who's in it. And a scene is something where, well, I don't know, there's a group of people in it one day and then they've had a fight with somebody and so they're out of it the next day. And it, it's like, it's dramatic and it's, you know, emotional. And it's... it's emotional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I would also, um, yeah, I think that's in, very interesting that your last word was emotional because I think that's probably something that when we use the word community, um, it's almost as if it, it's something that can be instrumentalized. It's dangerously close to constituency or something and it, it does have a little bit of distance in it. Um, it's, this is not something that I have like overthought in my life. It's, it was just kind of um, a, uh, it was like, like the tide kind of took me away from like using that word all the time. I, I can remember a time where it, um, it would have been crucial to me to use it all the time. Um, but yeah, I think this, uh, this, I like the drama that you're talking about and the emotion. Um, and I, I also, this is maybe um, too big of a, 
too big of a thing to throw in at um, the end of our conversation, but in a way I have been thinking recently about the word queer, which is, we probably could have like said in all of our sentences, <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or we did. put them in a fair <laughs> amount of the sentences, um, but I have been wondering if we're at a time when we actually have to be more specific than that, in the same way that community, um, if, uh, yes, I know it's a little bit too much, wow, I'll just put it back in. Um, <laughs> but it's a question, and I don't, think, I don't think we've talked about this. It's something I've been thinking about the last few months um, with the, this word kind of emerging into even yet another realm of uh, visibility and commercial life, I'd say. Um, and so I'm thinking, is this another time where we need to regroup and be even more specific? You know, And maybe this is, oh, that person just left, but um, in relationship is specifically to the, uh, the kind of um, Trumpian political moment also, um, as it um, has such a disjunction with other kinds of culture and uh, publicness, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, yeah. So. Yeah, I think maybe we should wrap it up. But, um, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so very much for, for sharing all of this with us. It's been so generous of you both. And uh, yeah, thank you and all for coming. And now you get to see Sharon's work. Yeah, now you get to see Sharon's work. <laughs>